Good evening, dear viewers. 13th of January, 2024, Alexey Ristovich in live stream with Vasil Galavanov. Alexey, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Traditionally, from the beginning, we thank uh, Armed Forces of Ukraine for affording us to work, to live, to continue doing these streams. And we really live. Leave your questions in the commentary, the most interesting will voice here, and also maybe topics that you are concerned about that we have not talked about. And, of course, we remind you to not forget to subscribe to Alexei Rostovich, YouTube and Telegram to mine, and, of course, to Privateer Station if you have any force left in you after clicking all these buttons. And let's start with the missile attack this morning of the 13th of January. Russia attacked Ukrainian territory with 40 missiles and UAVs. Eight missiles were shot down. More missiles have not reached their targets. That's what uh, our air defense systems told us. So without much analysis uh, capability, I mean myself, we can see that they're really declining the number of missiles used in attacks. They started with 122, then it was 93, and now it's 40. Some media are even dropping the word massive from the combination massive airstrike, missile strike. So why do you think it's happening? I think they finally finally coming to conclusion that after half a year of accumulating their missiles, they tested our air defense systems and they figured it's more difficult for them to carry out their tasks than they initially were hoping for. So they're changing their tactics. They're using forces in different areas. They're trying to attack targets in other regions. And usually the massive attack is connected to the targets in the Kiev region because that regional air defense systems can be broken through only with massive missile strikes. And when they're targeting other regions, they don't need as much. So when they use less missiles, it's not necessarily a good sign because they might be using less because they know they can solve their tasks with smaller numbers. But I would be cautious here because they likely will continue using their massive attacks still. When do you think, Alexei? In the winter campaign, most likely. After that, they will still have to accumulate their missile reserves for a while in order to repeat such a strike. And I did uh, say quite a few streams ago that this winter will be much uh, weaker in terms of their attacks on us. With missiles, first of all, by numbers, and the logic suggests that back then they had big reserves, stockpiled reserves. Now they only rely on what they can manufacture. They still can, but it's not that many. Now, about the real target of Russian attacks. If at first we heard that they were probably hitting critical infrastructure, energy, objects, and then there were discussions that they likely will be attacking industrial production capabilities of Ukraine. In your view, what do you think they are targeting? Oh, they diversify their attacks. We can say that initially they targeted industrial objects and then they're still hitting infrastructure i think it's just a complex approach plus energy and manufacturing capabilities they're really connected to each other so to a degree they attack decision making centers control centers they usually do not succeed but they keep trying and we need to remember the main thing about them they don't care about collateral damage that never stopped them guys i don't remember if i told you please click the like button it's very important right now under that stream under that video so more people would listen and watch us we're over 10,000 now today in taiwan pro-western candidate Lai Tsin Te had one who is for the independence of the island writes a wall street journal and that result will likely anger china and will heighten the tensions in the taiwan strait in your opinion do you think china will decide to carry out a military operation Nobody knows, uh, Vasil. It is not analytical category. Analytical categories you can calculate, right? You can calculate that many tanks versus that many will likely give you these results. And such a decision is very subjective. They may decide, they may decide not to. So we can just mention that in his New Year, around New Year address, Xi Jinping did dedicate some time in his speech to Taiwan elections. And he did say that Taiwan will be Chinese. So their position has not changed. 
and positions of Ukraine and the United States have not ch changed either. That Taiwan is part of China. China is not uh, arguing that Ukraine is not independent. We are not arguing that Taiwan is uh, independent, is a separate country. But there is the euro and there is de facto. De facto, there are separate systems, right? There was uh, Hong Kong as a self-governed territory joined with Britain's before. Something similar was theoreticized for Taiwan, but uh, it is not resolved, of course. On the last elections, on the local elections in Taiwan, the proponents of soft approach to China and soft uh, bettering relations with China have won. But the presidential elections, um, the independent party had won. So it's not even the question about when China will attack it, if China will attack it this year. It's more about the question, how will the new administration of Taiwan build relations with the United States because they're so pro-democratic and they're very, they've got very tight relations um, that force with American Democrats. So if Republicans will come to power in states, it'll be interesting how their relations will unfold. But if somebody will decide to create a fourth conflict, including like, you know, China, um, we'll see if America will have enough forces and decisiveness to participate. That was the doctrine of uh, deceased General Soleimani, who was talking about wearing out America and Britain by starting a bunch of different military campaigns via proxy, who was shot by American missile. He's the creator of uh, so-called uh, Soleimani doctrine that implies that main opponents of Iran and China, such as uh, European Union, Britain, United States, can be attacked, but not directly, by creating a bunch of different burning places, burning fires in the world. And here we can remember when the war in Israel started, 50, 70,000 missiles or shells were being transferred to and from Israel to Ukraine and back. So resources are limited. Now there is war with Yemen. They're using some resources there, but already, you know, that eats some of the reserves. And if there'll be a conflict with Taiwan, it'll be probably even more difficult to supply that with munitions. And my conclusion is that the United States and Britain and their allies can win only if they concentrate on one conflict, and they'll have to sacrifice three others in order to win any one. So it'll be a question whom they will choose between Ukraine, Taiwan, and, for example, Israel. Interesting. Interesting that all these three conflicts that you mentioned they are all in the package that is not being adopted yet in the United States in that financial package. Right, they're already connecting them. So now the question is whom to bet on and in what order. They definitely are related to American interests. They cannot not interfere in any of them, but by capacity they likely can prevail only in one of these three. So about financial aid, what do you know? When do you think it will be resolved? The signals are positive overall. The first voting is set to happen on the 19th. They still do not have agreement about the border part of it, and there are different formats, but there is some reserved optimism that we can exert about it. American money most likely will come, but under condition we should expect that it will be only one time during this year. And even if it'll be 60 billion uh, altogether in one package, um, first of all, it will be smaller, significantly smaller than last year. And second, we will, should not be expecting more this year because the United States go into the election phase and it is very unlikely that anyone will be able to press through with our matters through Congress. There are other methods. President, for example, could dedicate some reserves directly, but I don't think this route will be used. And that pose, poses uh, some serious questions in front of us in Ukraine. The administration of this aid, one time, and smaller aid than before. Um, our viewers are complaining that something is beeping. Sorry, guys. It's, uh, yeah, it's here, it's beeping in my room. And it's basically an appeal for help. Um, I cannot turn it off. and. Yeah, you can say that this is a special signal. Do not forget to click the like button, right? It's uh, 
good that you've heard it, uh, but please click the like button. Okay, so... The Ukrainian press is saying that some protection from conscription will be removed from congressmen in Ukrainian parliament. And as uh, someone unnamed from the Ukrainian parliament said, there is not much sense in this law, but otherwise people will not understand. So everything happening around this law, what about its perspective? You know, the changes, cabinet of ministers uh, pulling the previous version, Omyarov, Minister of Defense, saying there is a new version already in the works and uh, Congress will soon see the new version and vote on it. But that comment about uh, sending and allowing them to be drafted probably is about nothing, but people might like it. Okay, let me let's see, approach it from afar. One of the main deficiencies of our collective uh, psyche here in Ukraine is that we're very prone to some public actions, right? But it makes it easy to manage our people. If you talk about, switch their attention to the monument to Shores, they forget about five stations of subway in Kiev uh, being underwater. So they use that as a switch bait, right? And same thing, like in the fight with corruption, is very often used that uh, f that allow to one side of corruptoids to prevail over the others and monopolize the corruption gray markets. But they can point fingers and say, here, we're successful. So, yeah, here they can also play that same game, say, hey, we're also with you, we're just like you people. The fact that they will, they're will they not drafted probably will not sway public opinion much, but at least they can politicize uh, the congressman on this, saying that we're with you, we're in the same boat. And most likely, actually, it might be used, uh, they might send somebody to the front, but it might, might be used to punish some dissidents in their parties. So, what about the other approach with, you know, closing the accounts, taking away the rights to drive the vehicle, and all these uh, contended points? Do you think they were put in the law initially? Uh, there was a theory that they put it there on purpose so they can remove it then and then adopt it? Um, no, <laughs> Tr trust me, as somebody who worked with them for that many years, that's not how they work. There is a thing called Hello Razor, um, like a comms razor. Do not bring conspiracy theory to things that can be explained by stupidity. So, yeah, they, they are not really. They, they just published initially what they thought would work, and then they got some pushback, and now they're trying to fix it. In the meantime, they sacrificed Mariana, the congresswoman. What do you mean by sacrifice? As far as I know, she made a statement that she's leaving the fraction of the party that she belongs to. Right, she wrote about that, but it uh, doesn't mean she's leaving Congress. Exactly, she made a post in her social media, but from the rumors that she actually has not written any real message, and she has not really removed herself from her party, that this was just in her social media. Right, this is a story, and that keeps uh, drawing people's attention to that. And frankly, I think we can support her in a fashion that, uh, not in everything, right? I do not agree with her on attacks on Zaluzhny, but overall, she is bringing public attention to problematic issues. And our problem now is that we are not allowed to criticize military. Some military can criticize themselves, but then they are being poked at and they're called Minister of Whining instead of Minister of Military when they start to criticize how the structures work. And yeah, unfortunately, the army is a copy, carbon copy of our society, so all the flaws that society has, army usually has as well. But we need to talk about it and we need to keep bringing attention to it. Alexei, who needs to be talking about it? Do you think people at large or Congress, well, according to the laws that we have, there should be a civil control performed over our military forces. And first of all, it should be done by parliament with a certain committee, and everybody has different positions there. And Mariana's position is rather hard like that. And she was fighting internally for a while and then eventually had to bring it into public sphere because it was not, she was not getting success in the parliament. And the head of that commission, of that committee, has a different position from Mariana's, and there are other sides represented there too. So 
What do you think that critique serves in this case? Well, it forms public opinion that eventually, you know, in a roundabout way, but it creates and pushes an agenda and opinion of society that, hey, it needs to be changed. This law is unacceptable in its current shape. And it's not just Mariana, it's also you and me here with our streams and our hundreds of thousands and millions of viewers overall. So this is a strong story. It's, you know, it's a media, it's a media societal push. If it was not her, if it was a group of congressmen there with her, that would probably be also great. But I think our congressmen, for the most part, are rather scared of something. And I think they're afraid not even so much of our army, but as of, afraid of public opinion. But that's uh, like the officer's dilemma. You have always a choice to serve your leader or to serve your country. And our congressmen, for the most part, serve the leaders. They don't serve the country. They, they're afraid of public opinion. They don't want to dump it down the drain with their ratings when they take unpopular sides. And Mariana is brave enough to do that. And if we speak about public opinion, I think military and people are actually for adopting the different version of this law, right? Exactly. And for a congressman who jumped on the bandwagon after the initial critique, it was the political suicide for them to be the first ones, but then they came in later, right? Everybody had to chime in because the society had an uproar and they had to make a statement that they are with society, they're also upset about it. And, you know, somebody initially started that fire, and that was started to a big degree, at least in Congress, with Mariana. And you guys, you know, in society, you might stay alive because, or some of your relatives might stay alive because Mariana is changing the law from what they initially designed it to be to what society can agree with. We're getting some complimentary stream for Mariana. Well, yeah, she deserves some kudos because she had to be very brave in order to initiate that. And do you know that, by the way, she is spending a lot of time on the front lines, that she is, is almost always out there in the front, in the hardest parts. All right. Okay, let's uh, let the topic with Mariana go. In Russia, they are adopting a law that allows foreigners with criminal background to sign contract with Ministry of Defense. Why? Are they running out of Russians? No, they're not running out of Russians, but any source of recruitment of physical force is a precious opportunity in the 21st century, because humans in 21st century usually do not really want to end up dying in a dirty, muddy trench. They'd prefer rather to stay at home and work with computers. Well, but they're not fighting for those trenches, right? Yeah, you're not fighting for the trench, but you're physically fighting in that trench on the material level. This is a very low-grade pleasure, not really fun in life. So, and the moment you also bring recruits from other geographical territories, um, volunteers from other geographical territories, you immediately start the cross-penetration, cross-pollination. Because even if it's a small group, it's always penetration, and you will have some influence in those countries. Because if they came to serve in your country, they will represent to some degree your influence in their country when they come back. It could be a small group, marginalized group in their country, but they will still have some sort of, some level of influence. And that's why they're absolutely happily accepting them. This is like a liquid, you know, whenever wherever it can find capillaries or ways to flow, it will. So, do you think Ukraine can use more foreigners in the fight against Russia? Yes, we can, we could, but we are slow. If you remember, we had two foreign legions. One was under military intel, another under army proper, and the one under army did not uh, take flight because they were weak enough in fighting on the bureaucratic stage in order to get them in. Otherwise, we had a couple dozen thousands, actually a bit more, who wanted to fight. So, when our viewers often ask a question about so-called uh, foreign divisions that Ukraine would attract on the official level, do you think there is a chance for that? What do you mean? Just to invite by whole detachments from the armed forces of other countries? No, that's almost unreal. Nobody would want to mess with that. 
if you notice, American administration is putting the only one goal in both, in Israel war and here war in Ukraine, to not let the war spill beyond its framework, because they're really afraid of uh, getting a big war in their hands. So, if we're talking about smaller detachments, right? For example, there are people who are ready to come and fight. Well, first of all, it's not uh, too widespread and tropotype. There are not too many people who are eager to go and fight like that. But uh, we're getting them, and yeah, we could have created a couple of cores, probably. But our law is very slow. We're very laid back in this regard, and we, if you see, we're even discussing still mobilization of our own people, right? And when you think about foreigners, our laws are so rusty. So one can d indeed pose the question to deputies, uh, to congressmen, what the heck are you doing there? Right? Once again. Because we could have in invited and could have facilitated easier access of foreigners to fight in our war so that it would be a streamlined process. You come, you get equipment, you get attached to a certain army group, you fight and then you leave, right? Or you get compensated if anything happens. All right, let's go further. President of Ukraine, Zelensky, and Prime Minister of Great Britain, Risha Sunak, signed an agreement about cooperation in uh, security. And Britain became the first country of that caliber to sign such an agreement with Ukraine. What can you comment on this? that some people are calling to be historic. I'm at a serious dilemma here, Vasil. To say the truth would be not timely. Then I should probably stay mum. But I would allow myself to hint. First, I see direct parallels between Johnson's visit in 22nd year and Sunak's visit in January of 24th. Second, Brits are the last grown-ups in Europe who can take responsible decisions with some foresight, because twice before they already successfully actualized the visits of all the other government leaders that visited Ukraine after them. So if you see that French Prime Minister is visiting, now we're talking about President of Poland, oh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, right? Mm -hmm. So many people start to visit Ukraine and Britain basically provoked a wave of visits, right? Now they're competing about that again. They've done that several times already. For example, in April of 22nd, they also provoked Rammstein, in a good sense of it, the first one, and now they're doing it again. So about these agreements, I would not rush to call them historic. It's uh, very convenient for the current office of the president to call them historic. They're not ordinary, but if you dig deeper, this is a mixture of Budapest memorandum with... Um, what was done, the actually formulations of the guarantee formulations are exactly the same as Budapest Memorandum had, almost a carbon copy. So that's a very hollow in this section. And they do not make Britain do anything, anything new besides what they've been doing since the beginning of this conflict. From new, it's a very, it has a very abstract formulation to start consulting within 24 hours, right? So, historically, I would not use a groundbreaking term, but on the other hand, there are positive elements to it. This is a story about guarantees that appeared during the Istanbul process in March of 22nd. That's where we talked about some guarantees for Ukraine when Russian troops would be withdrawn. We even had the Crimean territory under question there. It was, as I said, a rather golden outcome if it was adopted. So the point is that there have to be some guarantees of non-aggression on Ukraine. And the guarantees were supposed to be presented by all the participants, all the sides signing this uh, agreement. And it has to be the major countries, China, France, Britain, Russia, despite that Russia was an aggressor. So in the future, to preserve its status, it would have to be one of the guarantors. And many other countries were planned to join some Arabic countries, the G7. And then 
out of this. They were building essentially that uh, repetition of fifth article, that if anything happens within 24 hours, the consultations need to be started, etc. And later, Zelensky's peace formula grew from this. That would have been a new word in global politics. This was the first serious suggestion. It's difficult to value the real seriousness of it, but it was the first official proposition put on the table of international community at large that was outside the Potsdam previous system. That unfortunately didn't fly. Now they're being discussed in the formula of peace, but they still remain a rather theoretical construct at this point. So I value that, however, that it was the first document to offer something after the Potsdam-Yalta documents, which already don't work. And, but if you dig deeper inside, it relies on a lot of things that and institutions that do not function much anymore. Helsinki, United Nations. So I think this is one of the bigger drawbacks of this document. Because on the 24th of February, 2022, Potsdam-Yalta system of relations deceased. And there are only two ways now. We either create a new system of security for the world or go there via the route of long and exhausting war, when at the end we still get together and write out the exact same system. But, you know, it'll be my contribution of, you know, of my mind and conscience into the global uh, bank of ideas that I did make this statement, I did make this offer that we need to change the security system. So when I'll be writing my memoirs, when I'm in my 80s, I'll have to bring that up and say, well, you know, there was somebody who suggested that early on, but it took a while to get there. So I think this document, that's why the document between Ukraine and Britain, the both sides understand that the old system don't quite work, but uh, they still reference them. And, you know, as for the direct promises to fill Ukraine with arms and shells and other things, it's great. It's a good uh, point. Britain is already trying. I don't think it'll dramatically change the flow, though, but it's a good point in the document. As for joint military production, I don't quite think that we will get to that level soon, but still it's a good step in the right direction. Um, I still would want to draw attention of our audience without going too deep because I want to talk about that after the war. But basically, the first one, the first country to react, is the one who usually owns the game. So if you think that it's only Americans who make major decisions in the world, uh, think twice. There are countries that are more adult than America. All right, guys, let's continue. I will insist again. 30,000 live viewers and only 7,000 likes. Um, this is disproportionate, so please, it doesn't take much from you. You just press this button and we continue going with our stream. It's a win-win situation for both of us. And yeah, frankly, that brings new eyeballs to the streams. Don't be egotistical. Share with others. All right, another question from viewer. Uh, guys, please continue asking more in the commentary under the stream. So, here's one of the questions. What perspectives does Ukraine have for offensive in 2024? Well, hmm. I've seen some voices, mostly where we make major decisions, I mean in telegram channels of our country, that soon we'll get F-16s and we'll start our offensive and Russia will crumble. Well, I would forewarn the fans of bright offensives with F-16s that everything may end up the same way it did in the South, only with F-16s. And Budanov, the head of our military intel, said that both sides do not have enough forces for offensive. In order to do that, there has to be a drastic shift of balance in favor of one of the sides. F-16s can do that, but only on a very narrow part of the front. So, if we, first of all, will get them in large enough numbers, with enough spare parts and enough munitions, then perhaps if we concentrate them on a certain part of the front, we can create certain breakthrough there. Maybe not a Kharkov-level operation, maybe half of it, but it'll be 
something noticeable. Or perhaps we will successfully destroy one of the Russian major groups, attacking groups, which is also a great achievement. But one should not expect big operative breakthroughs with F-16s. Do you, did you notice how some news are coming through, mostly from the Western press, but yeah, they still bubble up, that Russians are discovering ways to defend themselves from HIMARS, from our missile attacks. They're using radio electronic interference rather successfully to... Uh, could you describe in a couple of words to make it simpler for viewers to understand what's uh, what's happening? Well, yeah, you shoot a missile on certain coordinates, but it fails to reach those coordinates because, or, you know, it just falls in a different place. Because Russia is using enough interference and they're learning how to do it right. Why Sun Tzu and the other military tacticians were always in favor of Blitzkrieg, fast military operations. Because long war always gives chances to both sides and it changes the contents of war. Short war is pre-prepared army beforehand that has a plan that runs in fast, follows the plan, destroys the enemy and the war is over. Long war is a long route of fight of military industrial potentials. It's the work of military science on both sides. And the country which started successfully at the beginning, but then failed to organize the long-term race, their military industrial complex and, and the like, they may fail in the long run. Nobody knows then who wins in the long run. So Russian army, by the way, is adapting to what's happening. They have certain achievements. And as you see, right, the first initial 10 HIMARS that we got in 22, they upended the whole Russian offensive at the time. But now they adapted to that. HIMARS is still a very serious weapon, but they know now how to affect its targeting. Same thing will likely happen with F-16s. Despite our first successes, they will eventually find ways to counter it. And of course it has the reverse effect as well. It's the old uh, fight between a javelin and a shield. It's eternal. But uh, we can mention that today's statement by our air defense systems that 20 missiles did not reach the targets. And they didn't say they, were, they shot them down, right? But they missed the targets. They didn't reach the targets. So some people are already saying that perhaps Ukraine now has certain radio electronic weapon that allows to do that. Perhaps, right? But this is the situation I'm talking about, that one weapon can only change some stuff it's very serious early on when you just start to bring it, when they'll be learning it on their hides, how it works. And then eventually they'll figure out the weak sides of it and they'll reorganize and suggest something to counter F-16s. And then we'll need another means to fight with that. This is the funnel that brings in more and more and more resources. And just like the second in command in NATO said that indeed Europe allowed itself to relax and our military industrial complex is rather weak now because for 30 years we believed that there will not be big war. And this is exactly what I was telling them on my travels here. And also to our Ukrainian uh, sect goers of uh, witnesses of NATO that, you know, the West is in trouble. They have not much in terms of military production. All right, more questions from viewers. and. More often than not, lately, they are concerned with global security to a degree that they're asking for safe places in the global map. Karolina is writing, Alexei, in light of recent events in the world, where do you think it'll be relatively safe in the next 10 to 15 years? It'll be relatively safe in rich and independent countries like Switzerland, like Austria, because they're not really participating in military unions, and if the war will eventually, if the tentacles of war, war will reach them, it likely will be the last countries to be reached. If you can move to Switzerland, that's a good place to move. Yeah, by all means do it. You know, some people are saying New Zealand and Australia are also on that list. Oh no, New Zealand and Australia are on the anti-China union page. And they likely will be drawn into that funnel and people who are living there in Australia and New Zealand are probably to expect some surprises in the next few years. 
So another question from the viewer. It seems like most of Republicans in the United States are changing their narratives and they're ready to provide more aid to Ukraine, but they're um, building their election campaign in a different fashion. Also, a motion to attack pirates is a strong statement and Britain is activating. So all these news are generally directed towards aid of Europe to Europe and to Ukraine. So all these things kind of indicate counter to what you're talking about in the recent streams. Perhaps you need to change your vector, Alexei. Yeah, this is an illusion and that's what it um, intends to do. This aid is very illusory. What's happening with Britons, I already told you about the United States, I can talk once again. There are always a lot of Republicans who are very pro-Ukrainian. In the internal, unofficial Republican primaries, unfortunately, it's isolationists and populists that are prevailing, who are saying that the main threat to the United States is Mexico, and the main problem is not building infrastructure. Then one of the first questions you actually have when you come to New York, why so very few bridges? because they need them, but the bridges are not profitable or very slow profitable. It takes them decades to pay it themselves off. Nobody wants to pay for that. And the infrastructure is rather worn out. So many politicians put it on their banners saying, well, we're giving that much money to Ukraine. That's uh, the equivalent of hundreds of bridges in the United States. And all those people who are for Ukraine, who are pro-Ukraine, and there are a lot of them among Republicans or against Russia, there are even more of them against Republicans, they unfortunately bump into their own Republican populists who are saying that, well, we first need to take care of our country. In the United States, it's not even so much about Democrats versus Congress or versus Republicans as uh, isolationists versus globalists. And isolationists' position is very simple. They're saying your globalism is very expensive for us. It's in trillions. And they're against Ukraine due to one simple reason. It's not that they don't like Ukraine. That's not so. They are against aid to Ukraine because there is a story of Hunter Biden and the Burisma company, which um, Biden family stepped into and uh, the company and the whole and the, the Biden family is uh, under investigation for their corrupt relations with that company. And that's what Republicans are saying, that they don't have anything against Ukraine, but since we saw that Hunter Biden had some corrupt dealings with them, it's a very easy way to hold him by his balls. And if it was Zimbabwe, they would, you know, be in that saying that same thing about Zimbabwe. But they're saying that if Biden family is implicated with corrupt dealings in Ukraine, where do we spend all these billions of dollars that are being sent to Ukraine? Maybe Bidens are putting some of them in their own pockets. And they're building their logic of uh, countering Democrats' attack on Trump for the January 6th and other things, they are building their own campaign to impeach Biden based on that. But overall, they're not anti-Ukrainian. They're anti-Biden, and they're fighting with him for life and death. And it just happened that Biden family is implicated in corruption scandal in Ukraine. And the main message from the Republican side is, let's audit where the money go, because very likely we may find that Biden family is pinching some of these sums to lace their pockets because they've done that before, we know they've done it before, it was proven. So, those Republicans who are very pro-Ukraine, they are saying that, unlike Biden, who doesn't have a strategy where they just give money and not enough military support, and that probably brings big questions about corruption, we, unlike Biden, have a very strong strategy. We'll follow these steps and help Ukraine win, and that would be good. So uh, in my old dealings here, and I've met a lot more Republicans than I even wanted to, I have not met one who would have said, oh, Ukraine, Ukraine is bad. No, they come and hug and say, you, we're, we're with you, we're supporting you. And when I tell him, you've been just on the tribune there, saying that we should not be giving money to Ukraine, how do you coexist both points of view in your head? Well, and they say, yeah, it's a different thing. We're against Biden, we're not against Ukraine. So. Maybe you can find a couple who really don't like Ukraine, but, uh, and yeah, despite of the drawbacks the country has, their most attack in the United States is towards Biden, not at Ukraine. All right, next question from Belarus. Your prognosis about Belarus in the 10 to 15 years to come, 
I personally think there are no chance for Belarus to stay independent politically from Russia, but their kids, my years before retirement, I'm thinking I should probably change that and uh, change my location. What would you advise to Belarus people at large? I'll say one thing, and you guys think it over. I always try to get you to think. I will call out the main principle of Russian foreign politics, which has not changed for hundreds of years. It says as follows, all neighbors of Russia need to either be friendly or will be Russia. You heard that? And these are perspectives of Belarus and other neighbors of Russia. So here, one can pose the question, do you just and follow what Russia tells you, or do you start war with Russia? You should ask yourself, what Russia, and what do you mean by being friendly? That would allow you enough area to maneuver and to stay independent. But unless we reach a state where we are, at least on the level of uh, mutual non-attacking, non-annexing the territories uh, friendly, politically, these issues will continue and eventually russia will likely go into conflict again just like they did now and they are actually taxing all their neighbors who are not ready to be friendly they're taxing them in blood um, and they did spend a few decades without strong political push like that but now they're coming back they're reviving and dusting off the old imperial approach so if we are fighting, if we are indeed resisting, we need to be fighting for our lives, not with the lunch breaks and weekend breaks. And that's about Ukraine. But as for countries like Belarus, which are still somewhat independent, despite that Russia plays a very active and hard game against them to put them to the heel and eventually annex them, Belarus is still holding some of its own. Belarus people do not want to become part of Russia. They still want to have some independence. Yes, they are a union country, but they are somewhat independent, right? Formerly, their military is adjoined, but in this war, Belarus military has not participated, despite continuous Russian attempts to get them in to do that. And also, I'll tell you one more thing. Belarus is one of the three countries of ex-USSR that is run by a person who loves his country. Yes, Lukashenko is a dictator, yes, he's a horrible candidate, horrible figure, but he loves, genuinely loves his country. There was also Nazarbayev and Aliyev in Azerbaijan. I'm not really an expert in more countries in Central Asia, there might be others, but from the external signs, that's what it looks like. All the other countries were ruled by people who do not quite like their country as the country, including Russia, by the way. Vladimir Putin is drifting, maybe eventually he will start liking Russia, but the way he started his presidency, he loved the West more. Only when he figured that the West spat on him quite a few times, he decided to go a different vector. But it still remains a question if he will love Russia as a country, right, as a motherland. Uh, unfortunately for Ukraine, we never had leaders who really loved Ukraine. They love everything, but they don't love Ukraine as a country. And Belarus is somewhat lucky. And their enforcement agencies, their power agencies, are loyal to Lukashenko regime, even despite a few years ago when a third of Belarusians, Belarusians uh, had an uprising. Uh, enforcement agencies did not jump ship. They supported Lukashenko regime, and that's why the uprising failed. And as somebody who works quite a bit on both in the presidential uh, side and the enforcement side of things, I would say you cannot deceive the enforcement agencies. They know what they stand for. So the uprising in Belarus did show that the love to, Bel to Lukashenko is not really mutual, that a lot of Belarusians do not like it. Yeah, they're a very divided society. A third are for him, a third are against him, a third doesn't give a crap. But um, it would be wrong to say that the whole country is against him. In any case, he has enough love from his people or support from his people to maneuver his country physically outside of the framework of this active hot war. And historians will have to answer question, how did it happen that he managed to achieve that? Where does his achievement, where maybe the West or China helped him to achieve that? But they're maneuvering. And despite the fact that before this war, 
Belarus got hit several times real hard, making them more dependent on Russia by forbidding Belarus, for example, to export their own kalium um, fertilizers. So they only can export them through Russia. They're now really dependent on Putin's regime to make that money. And the whole world is now dependent on Putin's exports, which is rather critical component of fertilizing. It's almost as effective as nukes, because if they stop supplying it, a lot of countries will have issues growing bread. And when somebody asks, does Russia totally depend on China? One can say that China is actually rather dependent on Russia. If Russia ceases production of this fertilizer, China will face hunger. So a question to a new government in Lithuania. With all my love to Lithuania, I have a lot of friends there, but I would want to ask a question of their government. Maybe I don't understand something, but how does it happen that Russia has a monopoly for that fertilizer when you basically forbade Belarus to sell, to export kalium through you. They could have made done it through you. You could have made money both. Russia would not have additional lever against Belarus and many others and the whole world. All right, let's continue. Next question. Why shelling of Kharkov is somewhat intensifying with ballistic missiles? The answer, because the border is near, is not acceptable because ballistic missile has a long range and they could have flown to other cities. Well, yeah, because they're trying to break through our air defense systems. Whichever system we have, they're covering the city, they're trying to penetrate it. And they're trying to organize their strikes in such a way that we would not be able to counter. Because ballistics time of approach is so rapid that our air defense systems have very few seconds basically left to react. And that gives them higher probability of hitting targets. So the next question, I'm quoting verbatim, Alexei, who are you, who are we, and why? All right, my favorite questions. I keep torturing everybody with who we are. We should be looking into our history to that answer. We mostly, our, our audience is mostly from Russia and Ukraine, and I do collect, I want to tell them that. If you want to give me a present, find me a history book from a country where you live or where you have access to. I collect history books. In Russia, school history books teach them to be ashamed of themselves. I did say that on my position, my presentation in Tallinn. You guys are ashamed to be Russians because your books on history, they really are bringing up that shame. But when you read our books on history, our school books on history in Ukraine, they uh, have a very schizophrenic perspective where when we at the same time trumpet some professionalism like lo local prof localized professionalism with a manic of greatness and my problem is with our history books that most of them present us a fake history and the answer to the question who we are starts with the proper teaching of history at schools because Ukrainian history otherwise in the school books is a huge collection of myths. Starting with the use of the word Rus and Russian. Because until the early 20th century, for hundreds of years and thousands of years of our history, the word Ukraine wasn't really used. It was there, like it was used, uh, there, there was a meaning for that word, but it was not used to describe Ukraine. Right, you did discuss that uh, in the last stream, indeed, Alexei. Right, so the answer to that fuels the answer to the question who we are. For example, mobilization, which is a major project for Ukraine's survival right now. We're basically passing an exam for 32 years of our independence and will likely define with that mobilization our position for the dozens of years to come whether we succeed, whether we fail. And look how difficult it is. And it's so difficult because we don't know who we are and what we're fighting for. Because if we knew answers to these questions, they would not be just affirmations, they would be inspiring. Even if we just knew the, them on the level of affirmations, they would be very strong factor in our mobilization. Like, look at Israel. 
people are almost paying money to paying bribes to be part of the military to fight and they have lines well alexei one can say that there were lines to our recruitment places for quite a long time right but we don't have now well we've been for two years in this war and israel is only for two months right but israel is fighting for 70 years unlike we are right but the war of that active phase how long did they have it Right, the war of the 70s, when Israel had 2 million people living there, it was a question of survival, right, for everybody. And all Israelites flew back to the country from other places in the world to fight in the country where they were not sure if they had a chance to survive. The scale there is also different. Their month is like three months here because the theater is very small, is very dynamic, and the load on people who go and volunteer to fight this war is just as intense as here. For example, here, if Ukraine loses, right, let's uh, be frank here, the most active people will likely be executed. The patriots, or how they call them, Russophobes, or how Russians call us, Nazis and Banderas. The rest of population will likely stay, not much change with them, except for political regime. As for Israel, if they lose, nobody survives, there'll be another holocaust, right? I would not agree with you here, Alexei, because in Irpen and Bucha, people were killed not on these distinctions as you described. Well, that was a different phase, that's a hot phase of war. They are killing those who are suspected to resist. But you understand, they will not execute 40 million. They won't even execute 26 million. They will kill two, right? It will be horrible still, but in Israel case, there will be nobody left. They know that, and that's why they're going to the last battle every time. So they just know who they are, and we don't yet. We still are yet to find that, the real answer to that question. All right, next question or suggestion or appeal from a viewer. Alexei, can you make a stream with Dr. Komarovsky about upbringing of kids and the influence of men in this process? And education system, how it should help define the proclivities of kids instead of making them little zombies. Sure, with pleasure. Alexei, in earlier streams you said that destruction of two to three hundred artillery systems on the front will give Russia a serious pause. During the last half a year we destroyed over four thousand artillery systems, and what? And Russia doesn't seem to have any problems with it still. How can you comment that? Well, what do you mean they don't have problems? They have a huge problem, because um, frankly, we, we don't have problems with that um, with, with that now, because if they still had this artillery, four and a half thousand artillery systems, that would be a card that would trump a lot of our efforts and patriotism and Mavic fundraising and all that. And just because we destroyed those systems with HIMARS, with Mavics, with our patriotism, is that's why our front is still holding, or they're moving with very much blood and very slowly. It's a huge uh, resource that we destroyed. And if we haven't, we would have been in a much more precarious position. What do you think, Alexei, about Fagin's initiative for alternative elections in Russia? It's the first time I hear that. If you tell me more, I might be able to answer and react to it, but not ready to comment that. I have not uh, delved deep into that, so I'm not sure. I, I, let's leave it to the next one. Next question. What people in Europe think about United Nations? Are they upset about United Nations' lack of influence and basically doing an organization doing nothing? Well, there are different countries of Europe, right? There are different political subjects. There are houses at war. Let's take France, for example. There are conservative French, monarchist French. There are also French generality who wrote a letter twice last year and the year before that that france is, lo is losing and wasting something needs to be done about it and there are other french like new prime minister of france his uh, good friend minister of foreign affairs who actually was his uh, civil partner for several years and formally this is actually a conflict of interest when the prime minister appoints his lover or um, partner to a position under him if it was a man and a woman, they probably would not be tolerated, but those were two guys, so they are tolerated. So that Europe also exists. And there is Pope who said, uh, 
yeah, okay, whatever. And there are ultra-Catholics who did not accept even the first motion in legalizing that. And everybody treats United Nations differently. There are some people, some forces pro-United Nations, others seriously against it. So there is no unified Europe opinion on this. Okay, next question from you, or please ask, what is, uh, at what stage are criminal prosecutions against Alexei? Oh, I don't even know. My attorneys are figuring that out. You're not looking deep into that? No, not at this point. Okay, let's continue. I once again remind to do not forget to subscribe to Alexei's channel, to his YouTube and Telegram channels, and of course to mine. And side note from Privateer Station, if you are listening or watching that in English, guys, please do that as well. Yeah, friends, it's so easy. You just press the button and the stream continues, right? I mean, it'll continue anyway, but I personally will be very grateful. And not because I'm um, a fan of likes, it's just because it helps us to get new eyeballs on this. Okay, Alexei, is it true that you were an atheist when you were studying? And what's the reason for that inner change? Oh yeah, I answered that question quite a few times before. I was not just an atheist, I was a warring atheist, a fighting atheist. So in order to fight more effectively, I started studying the materials of the other side and something changed. And back then I even understood that something has to be rather strong and magical to change a person like this. So I saw that the source that I was looking into started changing me, that I started becoming better without making extra effort a special effort. And I recognized that as a force, as an existing phenomenon. And that's what I understood when I was still atheistic and I started digging deeper and yeah, that's what happened. Okay, forces of United States and G7 are supporting to confiscate Russian assets in favor of Ukraine. What perspectives for that? Right, the problem is that they don't want to share their own money. And we were suggesting them to start giving Russian assets so that people understand these assets are actively in use in different funds in the West. They are making profit on them. There was only one honest country, Norway, that at least uh, started paying Ukraine percent from those uh, 300 arrested billion dollars. But even that thought was difficult to push through. So this is one of the main questions to the West. We are fighting here for survival, we have limited resources, they have money of our enemies, they are using them, they are running them, right? And they are taking percent from their earnings. And instead of sharing the money, or at least a percentage from the earnings, they are refusing to do that. So now finally the topic is starting to be rising again. And hopefully it'll prevail eventually. We have been very methodical about bringing this question and over and over again with them. I think there is some chance for us to get monetary aid from the earnings from Russian assets that are frozen. But it is not going to be easy because the West system is based on it being a bit hard to take money away. Because money usually belongs to somebody, to private persons, to governments. You have to go through court system. This is against the whole ideology of the West. That's why people store money there because it's not easy to take them away from you. You are rather protected. And now they have to go against themselves to violate the main principle of um, property. So that is the problem. In your opinion, situation with absence of uh, winter heating or lack of uh, proper functioning winter heating systems, is there any chance that they will change the focus of their government, that they will stop saving Russians in Ukraine and start saving Russians in Russia. No, that will not happen, right? There could be a meteorite falling or second coming, but uh, they will still be electing Putin and they will not be changing their political course at this stage. Is there anything besides aliens landing that could have affected? No, I don't see it. At present situation, Putin indeed is supported by large masses. He is a match to their deep demand and his collective politics looks more and more like a realization of their uh, deeper demand, of a societal demand in Russia. All right, bloody demands they have. Yeah, the demands they have, 60% of polling. Uh, Yuri Ramayenko had an interesting stream about that. Answering the question, what's more important to you? Justice or truth? 60% said truth. 
This is a very orthodox Christian culture that is kind of their firmware on a deeper level. And by the way, Ukraine also grew up in the same concept that truth is more important than justice, than law. We tried to change it, right? We tried to use the Western side that justice and the law is above truth. And it's very inorganic for us, so we have a lot of tension against that. Our struggle is going against our organic culture, answering the answer of who we are. Our politics goes uh, against that. And they are going more organic to what they like. And with huge issues, right, with blood and stuff, but it follows the deeper underlying things in society. Here, it doesn't. All right, another question from viewer. Pakistan and Turkey also have ballistic missiles with a range of 1,000 to 5,000 kilometers. What precludes Ukraine from purchasing the missiles from these countries if the United States are not giving them to Ukraine? Well, if Turks are not letting our minesweepers through their straits, which we need actually to facilitate the grain deal, right, which Turkey is a guarantor of, what do you think? Will they sell those ballistic missiles to us? Turkey is one of the gray schemas together with Emirates that uh, afford parallel imports to Russia. They're playing a very complex game with Russia. They're rebalancing their position in the West and they're tightly tied with Russia on their positions in the Middle East and uh, Asian republics. So they are living in an interesting world where they semi-friends, semi-enemies. As for Pakistan, it's rather um, getting drawn into the orbit of China. So I suspect this country would not really be supported by China if they decide to give any missiles to Ukraine. And China is preparing right now right, to possible conflict with the West, so why would they allow any of their satellites to provide missiles? But it was a good question. It shows that the listener is keenly aware of different things. What precludes Ukraine by use of naval drones to stop Russian oil tankers in the Black Sea? If Ukraine destroys Black Sea ports of Russia, it will cut off 20-30% from their GDP. If it was so easy to destroy, we would have already. All these drones are above the water, and they are very noticeable. And if uh, the port services, military defense uh, is uh, good, they usually shoot them down. Maybe one out of ten, one out of a dozen can reach the target. Underwater drones have more capabilities, but they are still being developed and just tested. There was one good attack on Novorossiysk, on the oil refinery, oil transfer station, and that indeed affected Russian shipping. But one is not enough. This is a big system that needs a lot of pushback. And Russians are not going to sit there and wait for us to hit them. They are shooting at our drones and destroying them. So it's a war. It's difficult. And before we conclude, let me ask you this. Do you have any fundraiser? What our viewers need to pay attention to? Yes, we do. But I came here right after the seminar, the education seminar. So I will probably just put it under the video. Just go there and there'll be a link to the fundraiser. We definitely have one. We have over 50 in our pipeline. So I'll put that under a video. I know Vasily is gathering money for drones for 72nd Brigade. Mine will be under the original video on my channel. So. Yeah, and it's a rhetoric question, just guys, go, please help. Um, we're not gathering money for ourselves. This is our joint effort to help our military hold the front. So once again, there'll be a link under the video. The size of your donation doesn't matter. Everything is great. If you're donating from abroad as well, please, let's continue to bring this victory together. We've been live for over an hour. Let's not extend it too far. It's getting late. Let's not ask you to stay up. And I'm thankful. Let's uh, meet next Saturday. I hope next Saturday, same time, right? Okay. So, dear viewers, think about more questions. Post them under the streams. Take care of yourself and your close ones. Ukraine will win. Thank you, Alexei. Until later. Good luck.